service animals is indeed a very important thing. So um, we have some housekeeping chores. Welcome to First Tuesdays. This is a continuing, ed uh, continuing education program that the Washington State Library, um, which is a division of the Office of the Secretary of State, puts on on a monthly basis. We always try to address a topic of interest to librarians. And so obviously, this is one that has interested many of us. Um, today, I am your facilitator. My name is Carolyn Peterson. I will be monitoring chat. And if any of you wish to ask a question, please post it in chat, and um, our, our uh, presenter today will answer you. So um, like I say, if you have uh, questions, don't hesitate to put them in chat. Today, um, Jeremy Stroud intended to be here, but he had the double whammy of a migraine and back pain at the same time, and he is not feeling well at all. So Joe nobly stepped up to the plate. And if you have any issues, please email Joe. Or um, Joe, would you type your, I guess his thing is right there. So please type it. And would you also type it in chat? That makes it easier, Joe, if you would type your email in chat for us. So we've gotten um, more and more folks come. What we normally find is that people come until about 9.05. So we will um, kind of get started shortly. Um, again, I have already acknowledged who funds us, and we really appreciate their support. Now, we have some housekeeping uh, that we need to take care of. The Office of Financial Management here at the State of Washington, whenever we do any, um, when any agency does any continuing education, they want us to keep track of it. So what we'd like you to do is please, would you type in your name? And I noticed several people, thank you from Alaska, Palmer, Alaska, have said how many people are coming. So if you can type in and just say your, what uh, library you're with. And if you're a student, you can simply say you know, student. And then will you tell us where you are in the country? Um, so we need to know and what. So if you type in your library name and if it is um, and where you are, what state. So we really appreciate that. So uh, go ahead and type it in. And we will um, keep track of that for us. And I will watch and see if everybody, the little box tells me you're typing. I can see. And when those boxes go away, we will. OK, I thank you. Looks like folks have just about typed everything in as where you are from. OK, great. Lots of interest in this topic. You know, this topic. When lots of us began libraries, service animals were pretty a defined thing. You know, unless the dog had, um, it was a seeing eye dog, and usually had a, a vest identifying himself as such, or herself as such, you really didn't have any issues. It was very clear, no animals in the facility. Um, but all of this changed. Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And my favorite story at the moment is when this issue came up at the Washington State Legislature and people who were in favor of all sorts of service animals came down to lobby the legislature. And a hapless aide was um, caught when she needed to go on the floor. She handed her service boa, her boa constrictor, to a hapless staff member who was left holding the snake. And so it's like that was that this individual was con con convinced that her boa constrictor could be a service animal. And so to tell us how she would have dealt with us, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Marl. And Rebecca is the Discovery Services Librarian at the Western Washington University's Libraries. And she has a former, she's a former diversity resident librarian at the same institution. And so in addition to participating in credit instruction and research consultation, she leads the resource discovery unit, which is responsible for the user experience in the online discovery of resources. And so I would say to you, welcome, Rebecca. And we're very pleased that you are willing to share. As you can tell, you have a large audience. So this is obviously something that um, has concerned many of us. And so we would like, we're very interested to hear what you want to say. And so I'm going to turn the, um, the clicker over to you, and you can begin. OK. Rebecca, are you going to click on the talk button? Uh, 
Okay, Rebecca? Rebecca had some issues getting into the um, thing today, so I'm hoping that um, Joe, could you email Rebecca? We are just hoping that there is no problems. Um, Rebecca is, uh, again, like I say, at the Western Washington University, and she had some errors getting going. So we're hoping that um, there are no other things. OK. Uh, what is, uh, hello. Wait this is her. Rebecca. She... Is it on? Excellent. OK, Carolyn, okay. I'm so it sorry. Is. I did have some technical Good. difficulties on my end. I apologize for that delay. No, but thank no you for that lovely problem. introduction. Um, like Carolyn said, my name is Rebecca Merrill. I'm the Discovery Services Librarian at Western Washington University. Um, prior to that, I was the I started out at Western Washington University as the diversity resident librarian, and uh, that position morphed into evolved into the diversity and discovery services librarian position. And in that role, I got a lot of questions about service animals in the library, uh, and so what this webinar is intending to do is to provide an overview of the entire process of how our libraries uh, developed a best practices document and a protocol for multiple service points. Um, unlike a student or service organization at a university or a college or you know um, any other organization, a library has multiple service points. So developing pra uh, best practices for addressing service animal needs and concern requires consideration of those multiple service point. So I'm going to talk about that throughout today's presentation. So a brief introduction. I think Carolyn um, hit all the, the big points. Uh, I am the Discovery Services Librarian. Uh, I do have a background in diversity and inclusion work within library settings, and that has uh, informed my experience, and it has informed the work I've done around the best practices protocol. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add to the introduction is that I am deaf and hard of, hear or, or hard of hearing. Um, I do lip read, and so for anybody who has a question for me, please send that to me via chat, uh, and I will answer, uh, I will respond to you in that way, and also give a verbal answer as well, um, simply because without the benefit of lip reading, uh, chat is the best way to get a hold of me. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I do have some housekeeping details. Uh, I do have a disclaimer. <laughs> um, you know, service animals are governed by uh, laws, um, and I am not a lawyer. I'm not equipped or authorized to give anybody legal advice. Um, what I will do is talk about how I consulted with my legal experts on my campus uh, and how I used that information to develop best practices uh, in combination with my library administrative team. And again, I'll provide an overview of that process. Uh, if you have any questions, I would strongly urge you to seek legal advice. I know that we have a couple of folks from different states. I saw somebody, a group from Alaska. I think I saw somebody from Wisconsin. Um, Washington state law uh, differs from federal law. So what we did within you know, Washington state, what Western libraries did within Washington state is in compliance with Washington state laws. Um, and federal laws, according to our legal experts. And so I would, um, you know, I would I urge everyone to seek legal advice um, if you choose to make a best practices document. So for today's agenda, um, what I'm going to do is give you some institutional context. You know, what started this process? Um, you know, Carolyn mentioned that there is a great deal of ambiguity around who, what, what species can be a service animal, who gets a service animal, what task they perform, that kind of thing. Um, and so what I'm going to do is provide an overview of the questions that started this initial conversation, how I addressed that conversation uh, in partnership with the library's administrative team and with our Equal Opportunity Office on campus, uh, and talk a little bit about how we streamline all of that information into a best practices document, uh, and then I'm just going to give you some uh, reflection, the, the benefit of hindsight, if you will. So how did this process begin in Western libraries? Um, 
you know, we're in Bellingham, Washington, which is about 30 miles southwest or south of the Canadian uh, U.S. border. Um, we are a very dog-friendly city. We are a university library. Um, and so we have a variety of animals that come into the library. Um, and so they may be therapy animals, they may be emo emotional comfort animals, they may be service animals. Um, but we had a couple of incidents within the library, uh, and people kept asking the same question. Uh, and it came to kind of a, uh, you know, a request um, from the library personnel at a general staff meeting, can you give us, and, and by you, they were directing this question to the dean, can you give us any guidance on how we can address consistently and fairly and legally um, concerns, whether it's our concerns or patron-based complaints or concerns around service animals? Um, and after I saw that general staff meeting, um, I saw that there was a definite need from my colleague to get more information about this. Uh, and so I approached the dean and said, um, I'd be willing to facilitate a conversation on this. Um, we would want to partner with our disability resources student for students author and with our equal opportunity office and, of course, our legal counsel. And he said, please, you know, uh, go for it. Have fun with it. Um, so. so you know, if I could talk a little bit about what happened at that staff meeting, there were just a lot of questions that came up. Um, and so this really kind of boiled down to awareness around the definitions and the legalities associated with a service animal. Um, you know, how did the law define a service animal? What functions or duties will a service animal perform? What species can serve as a service animal? In Washington, state law has a different interpretation than federal law. Um, you know, and this is something that I had to consult with my Equal Opportunity Office and with our legal team to confirm that. Um, there's another question of who may have a service animal. Uh, what behaviors can we expect from a service animal? Um, you know, just all these kind of basic questions about uh, definitions and Legalities. Um, and then there were also some pragmatic questions um, for library personnel, you know, under what circumstances may I, as a library professional, approach a patron who has a service animal? Um, how do I, as a library professional, address patron complaints? Um, I'm sure we've all had the experience where somebody comes up to a SERC desk or a research consultation desk and say, somebody brought a, a dog into the library, I'm allergic to dogs, or I have a phobia of dogs, you know, this is you know, I, I don't, you know, this is an unsafe environment for me. I don't like this. You know, do something about it. Um, and that's a difficult position to be in because you need to respect, um, you know, the the legal right of the person who has uh, a service animal, but you also want to help the person who has a phobia or an allergy out. Um, and then there's a, a very real question about um, conflicting disabilities. So we have some library professionals, I have some colleagues who have um, very strong allergies and or um, a very strong phobia around certain uh, species. So how do we negotiate that so it's not an inhospitable workplace um, for those individuals? And so there were some very real questions, some very difficult questions that we had to um, ask and, and find answers for. And it was very much a process. So, you know, I'm, you know, I saw this, uh, the, these questions come up at a general staff meeting. Um, it was clear that there was a definite need for some answers. Um, and the solution that I proposed to my dean and my associate dean is that we have a workshop. Um, and so what I've done here is I've outlined workshop components uh, for everyone here. Um, and I talked about disability. So these are the um, components. I started off with a definition of disability and a definition of service animal. Um, and I also talked a little bit about why service animals are necessary. Um, they provide functions and tasks for a patron with a disability uh, in a variety of ways, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I did provide a definition of service animal, um, what you can expect from them. Um, I did provide an overview of relevant legislation 
Uh, and then uh, the the second, the last part of the workshops uh, consisted of small group exercises, where I gave um, I have I had all participants break up into small groups, uh, gave them scenarios, uh, and I asked them what they should do in that scenario based on the information they had just gotten in the workshop around definitions of disability, definitions of service animals, and a little bit of information around laws. Uh, and then we came together as a group and talked about about, you know, questions they had about the scenario, um, you know, if there were situations in which there was gray or ambiguity, how do we address that? Um, and so once I had the outline of the workshop, I held the workshop on two different dates at different times to accommodate um, the widest possible attendance uh, for library personnel within Western Library. And this happened in June 2014, early June 2014. Um, and the attendance was quite high. Uh, we have uh, in our library organization about 65 uh, personnel, um, a combination of professional staff, classified staff, um, administrators, and faculty, library faculty. Um, and I saw over 60 um, attendees um, you know, across both the days. Um, we pretty much got the entire library, and some of our student employees attended as well, because they had same, the same question. They attended this um, workshop. They participated in the small group exercises, um, and they found it very, very useful. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, I do want to go over a couple of things. Um, in, in the first half of the workshop, I provided some informational um, items, um, just awareness about law and definition. And I also want to provide that for the attendees of today's webinar. Um, I do have some, uh, so Washington state law and our situation governed by the Human Rights Commission um, and the RCW, Americans with Disability Acts from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Civil Rights has some really good um, I have put all this information into a private lib guide for attendees, um, and you guys are more than welcome to go to this site, libguide.ww.edu forward slash service underscore animal. Um, I have a poster session that I did on this topic, and I also have a, a list of relevant links um, you know, and resources. So I believe I have a question here. Um, oh, some Caroline's talking with Katie. Never mind. Pardon me. Um, so, uh, in that guide, I've provided a list of relevant uh, links to legislation that govern govern service to animals. So, in the workshop, um, there was some fundamental. Uh, needs for awareness of why someone might need a service animal. Um, and so what I did is I talked about the definition of disability uh, found in the Legislative Code of Washington. Uh, and so disability is the price. So what I've done here is I've copied and pasted from the uh, guidance document from the Human Rights Commission from Washington State. Um, they have a wonderful guide. Uh, it's, a very, you know, it's a wonderful way to get a lot of information in a quick um, plan. Uh, and they define a disability as below. And I found this as a useful strategy. Uh, I, I, this was incredibly useful during the workshop that I held because it expanded most people's definition of what it meant to have a disability. Um, so I will take myself as an example. I'm hard of hearing, so I have a disability. And that disability is pretty obvious to see. You can hear it in my voice. Um, I ask people to write things down. Um, I ask people to send questions to chat you know, to me, uh, that kind of thing. But for a psychiatric or a mental or a sensory disability, those kind of fall into the invisible disability spectrum. It's very difficult for someone to see that, to, to recognize that. Um, and so I mention this because service animals can um, be trained um, to handle uh, the effects of a disability, or mitigate the effects of a disability that is sensory or mental, meaning that you just you don't have any other information about that person's disability other than the fact that they have a service animal. And so I found this to um, to be useful in a variety of ways, but really just kind of expand people's understanding that a disability uh, and impairment can mean a variety of things, um, and just to be aware of that. Uh, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not the kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, when we're talking about how holding a workshop of 
about service animals, um, you, know, you have to provide the definition of service animal. And according to Washington State guidelines, you know, they have a, um, a couple of definitions. And I've got the source below there for you. Um, and for them, a dog guide means that a dog is trained for the purpose of guiding blind persons or a dog is trained for the purpose of assisting a hearing impaired person. A service animal is an animal that is trained for the purpose of assisting uh, or accommodating a sensory, mental, or physical disability um, of a person with a disability. So you see a dog guide, which refers to one species, and you see service animal, uh, which doesn't have any species limitation, um, which leads me to the next slide, or no, the slide after this, I apologize. Um, you know, I put both of those definitions down because Washington State has um, a more expansive definition of uh, disability and correspondingly um, a more expansive definition of, um, you know, according to my legal team, you know, I asked this question again and again and they said, you know, um, Washington State has a different definition of a service animal and has different requirements for what a service animal may be. Um, if you go to the Americans with Disabilities uh, Act on uh, and their guidance on service animals, it may only be a dog or a miniature horse. Um, and Washington State is different in that regard. So that, of course, because we're in, because Western Washington Libraries is in, in Washington State, that um, deeply impacted our best practices and our workshop material. Um, so we have the definition of service animal and dog guide. Um, I also wanted to provide an example of the services that a service animal or a dog guide may provide for its human companion. Um, and this is from this, that source given below. Uh, the reason why I do this is, again, expand the definition of or expand the perception of what a service animal may what, what they may do for their human companion. Um, they can assist individuals, they can uh, protection or rescue work, pulling a wheelchair, uh, notifying an individual about coming seizures, um, alerting individuals to allergens, retrieving items, uh, uh, medicine, telephone. Um, they, can, they can provide a whole host of you know, uh, training or, uh, of services that, that mitigate the effects of a disability. Um, and one of the examples that came up in uh, Western libraries was uh, we had somebody who had a service animal. Uh, the animal had a harness but was not on a leash. Um, and I knew this person um, simply because I had worked with this person in a different context. And I had additional information about why this animal was not on a leash. Um, this person was a veteran who had PTSD. Uh, and so the dog would scout the perimeters of the library spaces and report back and signal to this individual that, you know, the, uh, the space was safe and that person could go in there. So that person had a disability that required an animal to be roving and report back that the space was safe. Um, and so this is one of the many, many, many examples of how service animals really can mitigate an eff uh, the effects of a disability. And it just um, it challenges us to think a little more um, broadly about what they can do for our patron. Um, and so also, uh, again, I mentioned this earlier, federal and Washington state law, there are some differences. Um, you know, on page four of the guidance for disability legislation um, from the Human Rights Commission, there's, there's a, a point blank question, how does this definition differ from the Americans with Disabilities Act? And Washington state definition is broader and covers a greater number of impairments uh, of medical and mental and psychological condition. So, you know, Again, Washington state law is broader, uh, and they don't have any limitations for species. Now, if you're in Wisconsin, if you're in Alaska, this is where you're really uh, consulting your legal team is incredibly useful um, to make sure that you're in compliance with um, federal and, and regional laws. So, you know, we have a, a definition of service animal, um, and we have some other considerations. Um, you know, service animals are not pets, uh, so no pets policy does not apply. Service animals are not required, uh, according to Washington State um, legislation, they're not required to wear a harness or a vest. And so this introduces potential um, additional ambiguity for a library professional in terms of 
what they, um, you know, how may they, you know, how can they approach a patron um, about a concern while respecting their legal rights and respecting the library space at the same time. Um, another thing, and this is not, um, you know, this is federal, this is, you know, in addition to being good, you know, common sense and courtesy, it's a legally protected right, you may not ever inquire about a person's disability. Um, and if the animal is identified as a service animal, the patron and his, her, his or her companion are service animal are allowed anywhere in the public building. Uh, and service animals, of course, are working companions, um, and so don't touch them without express invitation. Um, so there's, you know, there are a lot of things to remember. Um, about service animals. And so this quickly becomes kind of an issue when, you know, uh, for example, I held two workshops um, back in June 2014, a lot of information to remember, how do you remember this effectively? Uh, and so my hope was that we would, you know, um, and I'll talk about that with the formation of the best practices document. So we're still in the workshop kind of timeline. I've provided information about what a service animal is, um, what functions they provide for um, the companion, um, and how a library professional may approach them. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a little bit. Um, so we're now in the small group activity. Uh, and so in providing you know information on types of service animals and about relevant legislation, I then distributed three scenarios um, among participants. I had them divide into small groups and review a given scenario. Upon reviewing the scenario, they talked, uh, they talked amongst themselves um, and discussed their thoughts. Uh, and they actually brought back many more questions that I hadn't anticipated, which was great, because then I needed to go and do more research on um, and then we came back together and shared, you know, uh, came back together as a, a, an entire group of workshop participants um, for a long discussion of that particular scenario, that given scenario. Um, and then, you know, what I would do was then say, excellent question, you know, according to a legal team and our library administrative team, this is the recommended practice um, and this is what we should abide by. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples of what those scenarios looked like in a small group activity. Here's one of them. Um, the first scenario is this. Uh, and so what I would do is just give the scenario to a small group and they would discuss it. And then I would come back with a little bit more information about a response and then some suggested language. Um, so scenario, a dog accompanies its owner into the library. So it's quiet respond to verbal commands quickly, displays exemplary behavior. It does not have an outward or visible designation as a service animal. So what do you do in this particular situation? Um, and the response is that in Washington State, service animals are not required to carry an outward designation of their service affiliation. Um, if, and so, you know, having that information from our legal team, having some feedback from my administrative team, um, you know, if the dog is not disturbing library patrons, um, the library administrative team advocated that there should really be no reason for approaching the human partner. Um, you know, but if a patron complains um, or the dog is behaving um, inappropriately, and I'll talk, I have another example um, in the next slide, um, you may ask a couple of questions. You may ask only two questions, um, and I have that under the suggested language. Um, and so I vetted this through the legal team again, and they said, you can ask, is this animal a service animal? What task does this animal perform? So notice it does not ask anything about the patron's disability. It's pro you know, protecting the patron's uh, privacy is simply asking, is it a service animal? What task does this animal perform? And then, of course, we thank them for their time. So we, you know, that's one example. Uh, another example that came up is this one. Um, an ill-behaved dog with a service animal harness is barking and lunging at a patron who's not a handler. The patron who's being barked at is visibly upset and trying to walk away quickly. Um, what do you do in this scenario? Uh, in this particular scenario, um, you know, it came up quite a, quite a few times, actually. People, uh, many of my colleagues cited anecdotal evidence uh, in that, you know, I saw a service animal that wasn't behaving like a service animal, uh, wasn't behaving like I would expect a service animal to behave, barking, lunging, growling, actively menacing another patron 
am I not allowed to say anything? Am I not allowed to ask them to leave? Um, and in consultation with the legislation, with my legal team and libraries administration, you can always, you know, the answer is you can always ask your patron um, to control their service animal. Um, you know, if they refuse or argue, you know, explain that the dog is menacing other patron. Um, for us, we would call our university police department and ask if they escort the patron out of the building if they chose not to. And so in this scenario, um, working with the administrative team, I put together some suggested language. Um, and, you know, basically, it, uh, please bring your service animal under control. And if the situation escalates, you can then ask them, please remove your service animal from the library if the medicine level patron, you know. Um, so that suggested language, um, my colleagues really uh, welcomed that. They wanted to make sure that they were being legally compliant and fair to anybody who had a service animal. Um, and the suggested well, language is incredibly helpful for them. You, there was a, a question in chat. Are yes. you going to be addressing it later? Down there at the very bottom, it says, can we? Um, very bottom, OK. OK, can we request documentation? Uh, OK, so. Um, uh, so the question is, uh, how can we determine whether an animal is a service animal? Okay, that's from Laura. Um, and so you, um, so this is where that's a great question. That's something that I'd probably, if I had to say, the most common question about service animals in the library. Um, we, as library professionals, are not medical professionals and we're not legal professionals. So when we see someone with an animal in the library space, we can ask them those two questions. Um, and so, is it a service? animal and does um, what task that the service animal perform um, and again you know double check all this information with your legal team to make sure that you're in compliance with state and federal laws um, that's how you can determine how a service animal is a service animal you can ask those two questions only um, and so we had some scenarios um, during the workshops where we talked about suggested language on that. Uh, another one, um, can we request documentation verifying that it is a service animal? Um, no, not that, not that I'm aware of. Uh, again, that um, because we're not medical professionals, we don't have, um, you know, we have no foundation for requesting that. Again, you can double check that with your legal team if you'd like. Um, but you cannot request documentation verifying that it's a service animal, at least not in the state of Washington. Uh, there's another question. Does the animal have to be house trained? Um, that was a question that came up in the libraries here, uh, Western Library. Um, and, you know, my colleague felt almost embarrassed to bring it up. Um, but it, it was a valid question. Um, so the service animal, so it really begs the question of who's responsible for a service animal. The patron who brings the service animal into library spaces is always responsible for the service animal and whatever that service animal does. So whether it um, is not trained well in terms of performing tasks, whether it's not trained well in notifying the patron that it needs to be escorted out of the building uh, to perform uh, their task, um, that so the patron is always responsible for the service animal. Um, you should not have to be cleaning up anything after a service animal. And um, let's see, another question is, would you discuss the differences between service animals and emotional support animals? Yes. So um, that brings up a really interesting question that actually would probably take a couple of webinars just to fully address. And I haven't spent a lot of time during this one hour to talk about that. And so I'm going to give you some cursory information. I, I apologize that we don't have more time to kind of talk about that. Um, but so emotional support animals are animals for the individual's well-being. Um, they do not require the same amount of training that a service animal does. Um, and so so I have not, in my research and in my consultation with the legal team, there's not a lot of guidance that I'm aware of for emotional support animals. Um, so a lot of scenarios in which we see emotional support animals are housing scenarios. So when you look at the Fair Housing Act, um, you'll see some exceptions or rulings around emotional support animals. Um, that's a question that we get in the libraries a lot is, you know, what, you know, so because we're a university, we have residences as well. Um, 
uh, we have residents as well, so people sometimes bring their emotional comfort animal, which is actually a cat, into the library, um, and they call it a service animal because they just aren't aware of the different definitions. Um, and so it, it can be, you know, it, you know, negotiating that ambiguity can be difficult. I, I do understand that. Um, and then therapy animals. Therapy animals are animals that are trained, like service animals, but they're trained to provide well-being and comfort for a group of individuals. Um, and so one example is uh, in our libraries, we have final week. You know, we're on a quarter system, or university on a quarter system. Uh, we have three quarters in the academic year. Uh, and, you know, by the 10th week rolls around, people are exhausted and they're overwhelmed and mental health is not um, at, uh, uh, at its highest, if you will, um, and our library has brought in a group of therapy animals. Um, they dogs, they're cats, um, and they just they're in one place, and people can you know gather around and cuddle with them. And it's a very very successful program, um, but they are therapy animals. Um, not service animals because they're not affiliated with one person and mitigating the effects of somebody's disability. So let me scroll down real quick. Um, and yes, UPD does stand for the University Police Department. I apologize for that. Um, so thank you guys for those questions. Um, let's see. So, you know, we had this entire workshop where I talked about the definition of disability, the definition of service animal, a brief discussion of emotional comfort and therapy animal, um, you know, and then we talked about legislation, um, talked about what we should do when approach, you know, when approaching somebody with a service animal, um, kind of going through that depth, had a small group activity, gathered together, talked about all, all this information. Um, and, you know, the, the first thing I got was, this is great, but I'm not going to remember it all. And that's entirely reasonable. Uh, so that led me to the best practices document. Um, you know, the colleagues were responded, my colleagues responded to the trainings with great enthusiasm. Um, but there was a concern, which was, you know, this is excellent information. How do I remember all of this information two weeks from now, two months, two years? You know, how do I, you know, this is a lot of information. How do I remember all the key points? Um, and so I said, that's a great question. Um, and let me get back to you with that answer. <laughs> and the answer that I developed was to create a two-page document that housed all the workshop content in a streamlined fashion. Um, and the reason why I wanted it in one, you know, a two-page document um, in a very streamlined fashion was that people could, my colleague could then save the document to their desktop. They could locate it at strategic uh, service point location. They could track the copy or refer to the copy uh, housed in the institutional intranet, um, and they could refer to the guide whenever they needed to. It's quick, you know, information that they could refer to and be confident in their language, um, their scenarios, and what they should approach somebody, just reminding people. Um, so, yeah, so I see a lot of questions here, uh, and I'm going to talk a bit more about the best practices document, and then I'll go back and respond to the questions here. Um, so, uh, so the idea was lots of information streamlined into a best practices document. And this is how I organized all that content. Um, and so, you know, this is a very brief two-page document. I talked about some guidelines with relevant legislation and key features to remember that were in accordance with state law and with our university policy, which is based on the Washington state law. Um, some recommendations on when to approach a patron with a service animal. Uh, and if somebody were to approach a patron with a service animal, remember that, you know, you can only ask two questions. Um, and, you know, thank people for their time, that kind of thing. And then the second page of the document was very brief scenarios about addressing patron complaint. While the workshop had content about um, a library professional responding to a service animal concern, the best practices document had information about responding to patron complaints. So if somebody comes to that service desk and says, you know, this is ridiculous and I'm angry about this, you know, do something, this is how you can respond to that concern. So we have the workshops. We now have a best practices document. Uh, and from there, I went and worked with several organizations within the libraries for uh, addressing training needs at multiple service points. Um, and I'll have, I have some examples of that. Um, so 
The first team I met with was the circulation services team uh, for kind of an individual Q&A during the staff meeting. They had some questions about what to do, uh, and so met with them for just answered some of those questions, provided the best practices document and all of the workshop material, and encouraged them to contact me if they had any questions. And if I wasn't there, if I was away on vacation or whatnot, um, you know, contact Equal, equal Opportunity Office. Uh, another service point was more of a, an employee type. We at Western Libraries rely heavily upon our student employees, uh, and they, you know, they staff so many of our service points. And it was important in terms of consistency uh, to provide that. Um, you know, provide consistent information to them. And so what I've done is participated in the annual student personnel training every September. Um, thus far, it's only been one September, but I'm uh, slated to attend this September as well, um, to provide an overview of service animals, what you can expect from them, what kind of language you should, you know, be using when you approach somebody, so on and so forth. And then another example of just, you know, ongoing training and consultation is service animals in the classroom. So, you know, we have library faculty who teach credit classes here at the university, um, and they have um, different scenarios in which they may encounter a service animal. And so I met with the library faculty for a brown bag on instructional strategies for um, classroom accommodation. Uh, and during that time, you know, I discussed the notification procedures. So if you have a service animal appearing in your class, how will you know? Um, you know, what kind of questions and strategies can you employ? Um, and if you have any questions, just, you know, who to contact for more information. So those are three examples of how, um, you know, different service points or different employee types have different information needed and how I tried to tailor all the information we had to address them, you know, at their point of need for that information. So uh, briefly, I want to talk about, um, before I move to questions, just some reflections. Um, I want to give you an overlying, overall timeline of events. Um, this discussion uh, will give you an idea of how long this process took us. Um, and hopefully, if you uh, choose to employ this in your own library, um, it will be a lot quicker for you <laughs> uh, with uh, this information. So um, the overall timeline, in May 2014, we had the stakeholder discussion. This is when we had that uh, general staff meeting where questions really just it exploded and people were really seeking information and guidance on this. Um, so I had that information, I approached my dean, I worked on the um, workshop, I developed the workshop uh, in June. I had the two identical workshops on different days and different times for maximum attendance. And in July 2014, I coalesced the workshop materials into a two-page best practices document, um, you know, approved by all the necessary stakeholders uh, involved in that. And then in, you know, September 2014 and ongoing, I've just been working with individual organizations and service point for training um, to you know, beef up their awareness and provide more, uh, you know, just um, more comfort in addressing some of these concerns. Um, and before I move to questions, I do have some final thoughts, um, conclusions, if you will. Um, so, you know, the first thing, obviously, is legal advice. Um, vetting any proposed policy or document is absolutely necessary. You should get expert feedback on your proposed practice. Um, and, you know, I, I would put it another way. Your policy, your document is not finished until you've legally vetted the proposed practice or policy. Um, so I would, you know, um, just Again, legal advice, legal vetting is absolutely crucial because we are talking about disability law and we want to make sure that everybody is protected. Um, another thought, partnering with your library administration team. Um, my dean, my, uh, my associate dean were absolutely wonderful colleagues to work with in this process. Um, they saw a need. They were very supportive of me in addressing that need. Um, you know, they were very happy with the best practices document. They had some excellent feedback and suggestion. Um, it was a very positive experience, and, you know, I would hope that, um, you know, I would just recommend partnering with the administrators in your library to address this. Um, something that, so and the next item is importance of empathy. Um, something that 
came up during this ongoing process was just um, some frustration because there was ambiguity um, and there just wasn't um, awareness. Uh, and I, don't, I empathize greatly with the frustration because there is some ambiguity. Um, but just reminding people that um, you know, ask questions, find out more information about every situation. And then lastly, um, you know, consistency is key. In order to create an inclusive and thorough, you know, library space, consistency um, is ideal, obviously. Um, so with that, I'd like to move the question. I know we have a couple in um, chat, so I'm going to address some of those. Again, please know that I'm hard of hearing, and so I might uh, I'm, I'm asking everyone to submit their question through the chat future. So let me go back up. Okay, so so one of the questions is, is if a patron says they have a therapy animal, does that mean they're not really a service animal? So if they identify, um, so this is a great question. Uh, if they identify it as a service or a, as a therapy animal, what you can do to ask um, for further information without violating their privacy is ask, um, so to clarify, is this a, is, first you want to clarify, is this a therapy animal or a service animal? And if they still have some ambiguity though, you can say, um, do you have, uh, what task does this animal perform? You know, you can ask a little bit about the task. Again, I would keep the questions only to those areas, and again, you know, I sound like a broken record. Talk to your legal team before you do this. Um, but yeah, just say, you know, if this is a service animal, you know, can you, um, what task does this animal perform? Another question is, are we to treat therapy animals the same as service animals? Um, Washington state law um, makes a difference between those two. And so we treat service animals um, as in accordance with law, the working companion designed to mitigate the effects of a disability. Um, in our library, if someone says this is a therapy animal, um, I mean, we're very clear about when we bring therapy animals into the library. If a patron brings that therapy animal in the library, we, you know, we stick with our message, which is service animals are welcome. All other animals should remain outside the libraries. Um, and so that, you know, that works for our state, our legislation, our team. Um, again, this is why talking, you know, this is this is the exact kind of question that makes me recommend that everybody everybody goes back to their library and has a conversation library-wide about what kind of practices they want to develop uh, as a whole. Um, because if you all you know, develop these practices together, you can all follow them consistently, and you can remove some of that ambiguity there. Uh, another patron, uh, another um, participant, my apologies, said, what would you suggest when a patron brings in a large pit bull, so it is an emotional support dog? Um, just the presence of a pit bull is threatening to staff and patrons no matter how well behaved. Okay, so if it's an emotional support, so okay, this is where it depends on what state you're in, um, and it depends on what practices your library has adopted. Um, you know, what we do in our libraries, we say service animals are welcome in the libraries. All other animals must remain outside of the library. That's what we chose to adopt. Um, and the presence of a pit bull threatening to staff or patrons, um, this kind of gets to the situation where if you have a colleague who feels unsafe in their environment because of an animal, uh, they have a phobia or an allergy, um, you know, for the university, we have a human resources department where that person may go. You know, they can go to that human resources department and seek uh, alternative strategy. Or we'll just say, I'm uncomfortable in this environment, help me you know, figure out a way that I don't have to be, you know, create a safe workplace environment. Um, another strategy that is an informal, uh, an informal strategy that I've adopted and some of my colleagues have adopted um, around dogs. I have a colleague who absolutely terrified of dogs. Um, and when we have therapy animals in the library, um, we've encouraged this person to go to HR if, they're con if, they, uh, if they have a conflicting disability. We've, we've done that. Um, that person has elected not to. But what I have offered just as a colleague, and this person is a friend as well, um, when we have therapy animals 
in, uh, I'm sorry, when we have service animals or therapy animals in the library, um, if she is concerned about the dog, she can call me or she can call a student employee and have them pick up a document for her or whatnot. Um, it's not, uh, you know, again, I, I recommended it, recommended that she go to HR, but that person elected not to. Okay, so another question is, we had an issue with a patron who bought a trained animal, a dog, and a comfort animal. We allowed the dog who performed the trained action and disallowed the kitten. Sure, okay. Yeah, could, the kitten could not be trained to lick based on the person's need of command. Um, you know, uh, so again, we allowed the dog who performed the, a trained action and disallowed the kitten who licked the um, patron's neck and made her feel better on the basis that the kitten could not be trained on command to, to lick uh, based on the need of command. Um, that's, you know, in Washington State, you know, that's where, that's what we do in our libraries. We say service animals are welcome. All other animals must be must remain outside the building. Um, we had some people bring in kittens. Um, we had somebody bring in a puppy. Um, clearly, you know, even if the service animal is in training as a puppy, um, there's you know, we just it was not under control. Clearly, um, so we did have to have conversations with that patron about whether it was an emotional comfort animal uh, or a therapy animal or a service animal. Another question: Is your best practices document available to us? Um, yes, uh, I can make that available to you. Um, again, the you know, please. So what I will do is I will ask you guys to email me after uh, the webinar, and my email and contact information is um, available to the first Tuesday. Um, what I will do to the best practices document is I'll put it in draft form, and I will make a note that this is. Uh, in accordance with Washington state laws. So if you guys are in Alaska, if you're in Wisconsin, if you're out of Washington state, you may be only required to um, comply with uh, America, the federal law, the ADA. And they, you know, according to the, uh, the documents on the internet, according to my legal knowledge uh, in consultation with equal, op equal opportunity, they define a service animal as a dog or a miniature horse. So our document would not be terribly relevant to you, but uh, how I've organized the information, the scenarios, and the suggested language that I've put together. Um, if that is useful to you and it's legally in compliance with your state, absolutely. Please email me and I'll share that with you. Um, so are therapy animals allowed or not? Um, I guess. Um, so um, I guess that's a, an interesting question. Um, I, I don't have a lot of context for that. Um, we invite therapy animals uh, into our libraries for finals week. Uh, and that um, is an invitation, and it's pre-arranged, and it has a very specific purpose. Um, and again, if you rem remember, the, the, all the definitions I've looked at for therapy animals is the, the, an, uh, an individual animal trained to provide comfort for a group of people. Um, under that definition, they're not quite a, a service animal. I mean, they're, they're definitely they're just not a service animal. Um, we, you know, unless prearranged, we ask people to only bring their service animals into the library. So again, uh, I don't know if that's, a, if that's the answer that you're looking for, um, but what I can say is uh, talk with your library administrative team to see how they feel about it and also with your legal team. So can we ask for a demonstration? I'm sorry, I'm moving on to the next question. Uh, can we ask for a demonstration of an animal's task? Um, so you can ask, um, you may ask to get verbal confirmation. I do not believe you can ask for a demonstration of those tasks. Um, and so, I mean, we have we have not chosen to adopt that. I, I don't think that's uh, legally allowed, but I would double check with your team. What about service animals and training? Um, this is iffy. Uh, we have, um, in, the, in our libraries, we have chosen to be expensive and say that if a service animal is in training, they're welcome because they are a service animal. Um, that is something that you'll want to talk with your legal team and your library's administration. 
Oh, and I'm sorry, but I think I missed um, where you explained how you can get your email ad address. My email address is available on the first Tuesday's uh, website for today's presentation. Um, my name is hyperlinked, and if you click on that, you can just send me an email. Um, also, it's just simply Rebecca, dot, uh, my last name, Merrill, M-A-R-R-A-L-L, -L, at www.edu. Uh, what about reading dogs? I don't think I have enough information for that. Um, and so, um, Ms. Tracy, um, if you could provide that um, more information for me. Um, and so somebody um, said, you know, often when uh, asked, so another question is, often when asked what, a service, uh, what service the animal provides, the answer is, he calms me down, what would be the staff's response? Um, <laughs> that's a great question, uh, and that's something that I know that a couple of our folks have encountered. Um, you know, again, this is where we have to protect patron privacy and also um, their disability, uh, protect uh, the, um, their privacy around their disability and the experience of their disability. Um, you know. In our libraries, we have chosen to ask another clarifying question, such as, um, you know, calm me down. Is that, you know, you can ask, you know, what service animal, uh, what service, what task uh, does the, you know, does this animal provide? Um, you know, can you, you can elaborate on it calms you down by comforting you or it calms you down by, you, you can ask that clarifying question. Um, but only around the service and the functionality um, so uh, of the animal. Um, you know, yeah. So I have a, an obligate uh, clarification. Reading dogs are similar to therapy dogs. I have a lab that is, uh, is both. A reading dog must be a therapy dog in order to have insurance covering instances. Inst OK, so um, if the reading dog is, you know, and I've seen articles in public libraries where they have reading dogs, we do not have um, reading dogs in our libraries here. Uh, if they're similar to therapy dogs, I don't have enough information to effectively answer that question. I apologize. I would talk with your legal team on that. Um, we just don't have that in our library, so I've not encountered that yet. Um, I apologize for that. Um, and I'm in another question. May we disclose to a concerned patron whether we know an animal is an allowed service animal? Um, so uh, I guess I'm, um, I'm curious about that question, telling another patron whether uh, that animal is a service animal. Um, so this is where we have to rely on the patron with a service animal to inform us whether it is a service animal. Um, I would not share that information with anybody else, because, uh, meaning another patron, um, because it, you know, uh, it infringes on the privacy of the individual who has a service animal. Uh, um, you may ask. If so if you have a concerned patron who's complaining about someone at the desk, and you go and approach that person, and you ask the two questions you're allowed to ask, um, you know, uh, and after that, you're, you've gotten confirmation that it is a service animal, and that it provides you know, a certain array of tasks, you may then ask the patron if you can disclose that information to another patron. Um, you want to ask permission and consent. Um, otherwise, I would not disclose that information whatsoever because it does, it has the potential of infringing upon the privacy uh, of someone else. So, um, I think I answered um, the question as effectively as I could. Um, about a service animal in yes. training. Can you allow that? Mm -hmm. Oh, a service animal in training. Okay, what about a service animal in training? Okay, so our libraries have chosen to um, welcome service animals in training. Um, the the legal guidance, as far as I can discover, um, and when I've asked, um, I have gotten. Uh, you know, our libraries have chosen to uh, welcome service animals in training. Uh, other libraries. Um, upon legal counsel may choose to do something else. Um, according to ADA, the service animal in training is, um, doesn't have the same benefits as far as I know, but 
um, Washington state law is a little different. And so what I would do is talk with your legal team again about whether service animals and trainings um, should be welcome in the library. We have chosen to be expansive and to welcome all service animals. So any other questions? Well, I am looking, and I don't see that I see someone is typing, so we'll wait to see. OK, excellent presentation. I mm -hmm. would, I would echo that sentiment. Oh, Very thank you. Informative. And folks have asked, uh, you know, are we going to have this up on the web? Yes. Um, the, our technical producer is ill today, and we hope to have him in either, if he gets things fixed, he'll be in later this afternoon. But I really expect that it will be up on the web tomorrow. So go to the first Tuesday's page tomorrow, and the slides okay. and the presentation will be, um, you can listen to them again, or the slides will, you know, so you can listen to the entire presentation again. With And then also, that way, you can get the, um, the necessary uh, things for the help guide. And if you want me to do certain things, you can email me directly. And my name, I, my contact information is on the first Tuesday's page as well. So again, that's Carolyn Peterson at sos.wa.gov. And um, you know, I, like I say, my contact information as well as Rebecca's is on the first Tuesday's page. So thank you for your attendance and for your good questions. This is a challenging subject. It really is. So it truly is. So thank you. It truly is. I think, yeah. I think that we will say thank yeah. you. And um, thank you. how do we get our CE yeah. certificate? Um, we don't do that. If you want to um, email me directly, I will send you back an email that said you attended this class for an hour. I can do that for you, but we don't provide a certificate. But I'm more than willing to do that. So if you wanted to email me directly, the individual who asked for a CE certificate, I will um, be happy to send back an email that said, what is my email? I'll type it right in. Here we go. Carolyn Peterson at sos.wa.gov. OK, any other questions for folks? OK. Well, seeing none, I will say thanks again for a great presentation. We very much appreciated it. And uh, we will hopefully see other folks. Keep an eye on the First Tuesday's website uh, page or join our listserv to be notified about other topics that we identify. So thanks, everyone. And thank you, Rebecca. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.